This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger and the Ledger Nano S. Half peace of mind in knowing your private keys are protected by industry standard physical security. Go to ledgerwallet.com to learn more. And by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Today, uh, our topic of discussion will be governance, and we, we are talking to Dave Collins and Jake Yokompai, who are the development lead and project lead of the Decred project. Decred stands for Decentralized Credit. This is a cryptocurrency system that has made some interesting governance innovations and we'll go through how they handle changes to the protocol of, of the cryptocurrency system. So uh, with that, let's begin. Uh, Dave and Jake, great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be on here. Nice to see you, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. So tell us about your background story. How did you end up starting the Decred project? Oh, the uh, the Decred project uh, began uh, as an outgrowth of a white paper that was posted on Bitcoin Talk in April of 2013. So, um, in April of 2013, a uh, you know a white paper was posted for a, t- a coin called Memcoin Two, and it was posted by uh, someone named Adam McKenzie. And basically, it was an idea to hybridize proof of work and proof of stake. Instead of, uh, instead of just having a proof-of-work dominated system or even a proof-of-stake dominated system is to hybridize the two so that they sort of have their incentives aligned and uh, it, allowed for, it allowed for on-chain governance. And then from there is, you know, that's uh, what really led to the start of Decred. Um, Adam McKenzie and, uh, and another user uh, named Ingsoc pursued, uh, pursued contact with me some, starting sometime in approximately July of 2013. And then they, uh, they pushed me uh, for several months to pick up uh, Memcoin 2 as a project. And ultimately, Decred is what came out after that process started in roughly you know, March or February of 2014. Yeah, so for, um, from my perspective, that's, I got involved slightly after that point. Uh, one of the things that we really, that I was really excited about it is because we really kind of started to see the governance issues that Bitcoin had. Um, we Up until that point, we had started developing BTC Suite, which is a alternative bull node Bitcoin client. And after going through that process and, and getting a, a little bit further into it, it really became apparent that there were going to be issues uh, around governance. And so you know, we started looking at the the decred model and the proof of activity based model, we started to see that, okay, yeah, this is a elegant solution to the issue. And that sort of kickstarted the the process even further. I think that was probably the point when we started paying a little bit more attention to the, <laughs> the petitions. Yeah. I mean, people were pushing to get, uh, you know, to get a hold of, um, you know, to get a hold of us and to get us to work on their project. But, you know, the more, the more involved we became with Bitcoin, the more clearly we saw that there were serious governance problems with Bitcoin, and that you know any you know a model that allowed people to to vote on chain for you know to make all kinds of different decisions had a lot of merit to it because in Bitcoin there just you know there was no infrastructure like that and and you know things weren't very bad in 2013 by any means but in throughout 2014 it became a lot more apparent with the you know with the uh, rise of blockstream and sort of the centralization of Bitcoin development so back then as, as you mentioned you know, the the idea of governance of Bitcoin um, it, it, it was it was a topic that wasn't really you know, put on the table as it is now with uh, with these governance issues that have come up in the last, I'd say, two years or so. Um, what was the reception from the community uh, to your idea of sort of decentralized governance and governance that is managed uh, by a decentralized protocol? I think that the idea really resonates with some people. Um, you know, if you spent enough time in the Bitcoin community, you've become, you know, uh, 
educated in, involuntarily on the, the problems with governance. So over time, you know, more and more people have, have sort of switched on and, and said, wow, you know, you guys really do have a point and you did see where, you know, sort of where the train was going. And, um, but early on, there were a lot of people who were like, whoa, there's nothing, you know, it's, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. And the room's on fire. And we're like, well, we realize the room is fire. We're going to go to this other room over here. And, um, you know, the number of people who, who see that has definitely grown over time. I mean, without the people who saw the merit in that sort of, uh, you know, in that, you know, in the problems that we, you know, that we presented before we launched Decred in February of 2016, without those people, we wouldn't have had much of a network to begin with. And that's really, you know, ultimately where value comes from in terms of uh, these uh, cryptocurrencies. And so before working for Decred, you had uh, developed a, a Bitcoin client. Can you tell us about the motivations for that project? Uh, did, did that Bitcoin client also include some of these decentralized governance uh, systems? So, yeah, the, the main motivation that we first got started writing it is that we started getting involved in Bitcoin. And like everybody else, we saw the value of it. Uh, you know, like, hey, this is a great idea. But one of the problems that we noticed way back then, I think we're talking about 2013 now, it was that there really was only a single client on the network. And we saw that as an issue because if you look at pretty much any other, you know, internet scale or any, any big protocol like TCP IP, there are multiple implementations, multiple stacks. And we think that it's really important for there to be multiple implementations so that if there's a bug in, in one implementation, you're only going to affect that specific subset of the network as opposed to the entire network. And that was kind of the driving motivation that got us started working on, uh, on BTC Suite. Uh, at the time, the only thing we were focused on was re-implementing everything so that there was actually a replacement for Bitcoin Core that you could run either one. You can completely validate all blocks, the exact same rule set, uh, and, and have a viable alternative so that you weren't locked into a single implementation. So, so tell us about the consensus mechanism of uh, of Decred. What have you innovated on with the consensus mechanism and how the network works? Well, what we've done differently than other projects is is historically, or to, you know, or to date, the bulk of these uh, the bulk of the consensus models, at least for determining consensus on the network, were proof of work based. Some of them were proof of stake based. And there were a couple that, that, that you know, may, took a stab at hybridizing proof of work and proof of stake. And the way, you know, the way Decred is different is that instead of proof of work miners being the only, uh, you know, the only uh, group with right access to the shared ledger that, you know, the, or that, that comprises your cryptocurrency, we added the ability for, um, we added the ability for, <clears throat> for the stakeholders to override the proof of work miners. So that in the in the instance, I mean, even back in say 2013 and 2014, you would see things like empty blocks mined with Bitcoin. So when there's an empty block mined with Bitcoin, it's really, you know, a, a it's a low grade denial of service attack. That is, it's a miner going, listen, I just want to get this block reward. I'm not going to put any transactions in this block. I'm just going to push it out and get my 25 Bitcoins or whatever. And that, uh, that process, we saw that as just bad on top of the fact that these people really controlled all the consensus rules. So, you know, the, the hybridization takes the power away from people who own specialized expensive computer equipment, ASICs or GPU farms, and who have access to artificially and oftentimes artificially cheap uh, power. And it puts the power back in the hands of the people who actually, you know, buoy the value of the currency, the people who hold the coins. So, so that's really the idea with the proof of proof of you know the hybrid proof of work proof of stake, which is that proof of work matters, and we definitely want those those people to participate, but we don't want them to ru absolutely run the show. So the people who run the show are the people who hold the coins, and in some cases those two parties actually overlap. You know, you might be a miner who never sells any of your coins. So um, in terms of it being different, it's also a feedback mechanism where people can on make on chain submissions. Uh, about their opinion on various issues that we put up for vote, which was part of the original system proposed in the MC2 white paper. So this is an interesting concept because if, if we sort of compare this to what's happening in the in Bitcoin now, uh, there are a series of mechanisms by which miners um, and users are signaling their support for an upgrade to the network. And you know we go into you know, all of those different uh, proposals, but essentially it 
they sort of seem like hacks, right? Um, like signaling your support through like a bit that you're voting on um, when when mining a block, and then of course there's the user activated soft fork, which isn't really a user activated soft fork. It's just sort of forcing um, uh, forcing the network to only take into account certain blocks that I'm mean, basically you know. Closing, closing your your eyes to other miners that are not signaling support for um, for the blocks that, that you, you want to support. So uh, th this is a very different type of, uh, of of mechanism where, in fact, you're not only allowing miners to uh, have right access to the database, but also allowing uh, allowing users that hold coins uh, to uh, signal support for certain types of upgrades. Can can you talk about what um, what scenarios do you think this would be useful in? Like, if you compare this to Bitcoin, is this have you have you thought about how this could be used to say, for instance, upgrade the Bitcoin network to like a two megabyte blocks or segregated witness or uh, any one of these proposals that we have today? Right. So that I mean, obviously, that's the elephant in the room: the the scaling debate in Bitcoin. And so, one of the first votes that we actually had in Decred was on the test network. Uh, was to raise the block size to sort of prove that the, the system works or not. Uh, so, you know, one of the, to answer your question a little more concretely, really the, what I think is so exciting about the system is that it allows the stakeholders to basically completely control the direction. I mean, we're not just talking about block sizes here. We're talking about, for example, when quantum, quantum computing becomes a little bit more relevant, uh, you, you want to switch over to a quantum uh, proof crypto cryptography or anything like that, quantum resistant cryptography. Uh, you know, you can change the signature algorithm, you can change the encoding mechanisms, you can change uh, pretty much any parts of the system, and, and we think that's really important because, while you know, right now the system seems may seem great and the certain and the technology is fantastic, things advance over time, and so you definitely have to have some way to continue to upgrade those rules and the chain as as time moves along. And that really is, as you mentioned, I, I, I think one of the fundamental mistakes really in, in my mind in Bitcoin is the fact that there really is that lack of governance. There is no way to trustlessly uh, signal that this is really what users want. Uh, as you mentioned, I mean, there's like polls on Twitter, there's Reddit, there's these Coinbase polls that are coming out now, uh, forums. But all of the cases, they're not actually polling people who necessarily own the currency. It can be anybody who just says, who doesn't have any skin in the game, who really doesn't care what happens to the currency because it, it doesn't really affect them, going, ah, I want that, or no, I don't want that. And so it, with the Decred proof of stake system, the thing that I, uh, that I think is so novel about it is that the people who are actually making those decisions are people who are actually directly that people actually directly own the currency. They are the stakeholders. They have skin in the game. It really affects them. Um, so that's, uh, in my view, that's that's why it's so important. So there are a few other protocols that that allow and sort of incumbent and include uh, decentralized governance. Of course, Dash is one of them. Um, I think we mentioned another word earlier. Uh, I forget the name, but so. This idea is not new, and uh, and we'll talk about it later in the show, but you have demonstrated that this can be done. You've, in fact, done a protocol upgrade using um, this this uh, this voting mechanism. Why do you think this is something that isn't really on the table for a protocol like Bitcoin that obviously, as we have seen, sorely needs this type of governance system? So... In my opinion, I think the biggest reason that, that Bitcoin doesn't have it is because it requires quite a few changes to the core protocol, and therein lies the problem. I mean, we're struggling over to change something as simple as whether or not we're going to increase the block size. When you start talking about actually having an integrated, transparent, cryptographically secure voting system on-chain, you have to make changes at the consensus level in order to enable that. And so, you know, convincing everybody without a formalized system of governments to begin with, to put a system of governments in place, it's sort of like the chicken and egg problem, right? And so, I, you know, I, to be honest, like, I don't see it really happening in Bitcoin because of that fact. There's the, really, you have to change a lot of things at the, at the fundamental level in order to enable it. Um, 
I guess what I should talk about a little bit when you're, when you're talking about the other systems. So one of the key differentiators, I, I think, with Decred versus some of the other governance systems that are out there is that most of them are sort of, uh, how would I say, kind of like opt-in in a way. You know, you, you might have some other nodes that exist out there uh, or a signaling mechanism of some form or another. But the reality is in all those systems, users signal, hey, I want something. And then it's up to the developers to go and actually implement it. And then somebody, one of those developers, they basically flip a switch. They're like, okay, these are the new rules. They're active. The end. Um, we approach that a little bit differently in Decred in the sense that we develop it up front. We put the rules into the code. They're just dormant. They're inactive. So they don't take effect unless the stakeholders actually vote them in. But the difference is, is that rather than saying, we want this, and then you're not sure what the actual final implementation you're going to get is in that scenario. You're like, you can say, I want, you know, whatever. We'll just say smart contracts. Like, eh, the stakeholders say, I want smart contracts. Well, what the developers actually finally de deliver may not be what the stakeholders originally envisioned, right? Because the, the final product, the final developed product, it may be something completely different. So, you know, with, with our system, we have it there where the stakeholders are actually voting on the final product. They know exactly what it will do what it gives them and what it doesn't give them, uh, you know, the, the pros and cons of that specific implementation, and then, you know, they either activate it or they don't. And so that is really kind of the biggest difference between all the other uh, governance systems that I've seen in the other projects to date. I, I think that Dave has a good point here with, you know, with the conflict with Bitcoin. I mean, the way I can, you know, one way to view Bitcoin is, is that it's essentially a deadlocked corporate entity. Um, in the sense that, you know, what can happen if you have, like, let's say you have four founders and everybody has 25% ownership of a company. You, what can happen is you can get into the situation where it's only, you know, you have groups of two, two versus two, so it's 50% versus 50%. And that's typically not enough to form a majority in a, you know, in a, in a normal business. And then as a result, the company deadlocks. And uh, I've actually experienced this myself firsthand, which is, I think, part of the reason why we were sensitive to what we saw as issues within Bitcoin earlier on, which is that, you know, we see it and we're like, I see where this, I see where this is going and this is going to lead to a deadlock or fighting or something along these lines. And, and just like Dave pointed out, the unfortunate reality is, is, that the, is that the amount of changes that need to happen in order to get to the point where you can have a decentralized system like this that's binding and on chain, it's a lot of changes. I mean, it took, uh, it took like a solid, you know, real solid year of development to make that happen. And that was without a multi, multi-billion dollar system running underneath it. So, you know, it, trying to fix a deadlocked company is very, you know, serious business. And in a lot of cases, what ends up happening is, is that um, a deadlocked company has to be dissolved. And then you have to form a new company and sort of, you know, keep the ball rolling with that. So as much as, you know, I, I think we all want to see better governance in Bitcoin, I think that the probability of them uh, adopting a system like the one that we have is, ex is exceedingly low. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Ledger, makers of the best hardware key security solution on the planet. But Ledger is more than just a hardware wallet. It's your path to eternal bliss and happiness and peacefulness. Do I look like I'm losing sleep? I am, but it's not because I'm worried about my cryptocurrency, my Bitcoin or my Ether, and that's because I use a Ledger. Ledger devices support multiple cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash and more and you can even secure your ERC Ethereum tokens with them or you can add the security support from Ledger to some of the wallets you already love and use like Electrum, Copay, My Ether Wallet and others. All your keys and segregated accounts are derived from one unique seed. Seeds are generated on the device and are never exposed to the host computer. So when you make a transaction, your ledger will present you with the details and kindly ask you for your confirmation before signing. How polite is that? So the best choice right now for anyone looking to invest in security is the Ledger Nano S. It's a keychain sized device that fits in your pocket. It has a screen and buttons and connects to your computer or Android phone using USB. Look, if you're holding crypto and you're storing your keys on your computer, on your phone, or worse, an exchange, you know that's a disaster waiting to happen. Don't be the person that loses their keys because they were careless with them. 
So don't wait any longer. Secure your Bitcoin, secure your Zcash, secure Ether. Go to ledgerwallet.com and get your Ledger Nano S today. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter. So presumably more systems like this will continue to enter the space. You know, there's Tezos, uh, there's Decred, there, there are other systems as we've mentioned. Um, what do you, th I mean, what do you think will happen to Bitcoin if it doesn't onboard uh, or if it doesn't adopt a system like this, I mean, if it just keeps lagging behind, I mean, on the on the one hand, it is the 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 largest cryptocurrency with the most market cap and the most use, the most usage and the most number of users. Uh, but on the other hand, if it if it cannot evolve to support these types of mechanisms that will be presumably, you know, current in in all other currencies uh, and all other other public blockchains. What, what do you think the future holds for Bitcoin then? You know, it's hard to say for sure, but I, there is a, another viewpoint that uh, I think holds some value, and that is the sense that you know perhaps one of the good benefits is I, I think ultimately there are going to be multiple currencies, right? I mean, I don't think there's going to be the one to rule them all, so to speak, just like in the real world we have dollars, euros, and everything else. So I think there are ultimately going to be multiple currencies, and, and the different currencies will each have their strengths and weaknesses. So... You know, it could be that one of the strengths of Bitcoin ultimately ends up being that, you know, it isn't changeable, that it's just straight immutable, that like it's impossible to change. Um, there is some value in that in my mind. The, the, you know, the, 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 I think that it does pose problems in the future when you start talking about how you want to keep up with it being used as a currency. However, if you just want it to be a settlement layer, if you, if you really just want it to be digital gold as its tagline is, um, you don't really need it to change for that, right? You, you know, to, to use it as a currency, yes, I, you definitely need to change. But just as a store of value, so perhaps uh, if, you know, from that perspective, there will still be value in it, even, and, and that value may be derived from the fact that it just straight can't change, that it is the immutable store of value. And so I think that's a, you know, a, a valid viewpoint. As far as, I mean, but in my opinion, I think that its usefulness as a currency if it can't come up with some form of governance system, some way to continue moving forward will be greatly diminished over time. One of the challenges with, with, with Bitcoin is that ultimately like you can uh, think of like the coin holders as like the, as the ultimate shareholders of the system, right? But now these shareholders are sort of uh, recruiting these miners in order to secure the chain and in, in Bitcoin, what happens is that uh, the shareholders are completely held hostage to the miners in order to upgrade the chain. It's like only the mining community can really upgrade the chain and like the shareholders, the actual shareholders don't have a say in the upgrade process, have, don't have much say in the upgrade process at all. I think this is a fundamental problem with proof of work, right? Like with, with, with this, whenever there's proof of work, you're going to need you're going to have these two different communities, the coin holders and the miners, and they might be at odds with each other. So when you are, when you, when you were building Decred and it was like going to be a system that's focused on governance, why did you choose proof of work at all? Why not go for a pure proof of stake system and cut out the mining community? The reason we decided not to go with, uh, you know, a pure proof of stake system is, is that the issue with a pure proof of stake system is, is the quote, you know, the there's nothing at stake problem. The idea being that let's say you start the currency. So whoever has the most, the, the largest balance as of, you know, point X in time, well, they're going to continue to grow their share of the currency, you know, substantially over time. So basically it's, it becomes too much of a, uh, uh, without proof of work, that is some way for people to show up who don't necessarily yet have, you know, skin in the game in the form of coins without a system for people to show up and put their skin in the game, you know, in a physical way, the, the people who own the currency first end up holding the, the gross majority of it. And it's, so it's sort of like, you know, uh, it's sort of like an oligarchy in that sense. You know, if you showed up and you're Duke so-and-so, you're always going to be Duke so-and-so and, you know, so will your kids and everybody who's related to you. And, uh, you know, whereas it, it, with proof of work, it's a little bit more like, hey, you know, I, I could show up and do something really useful for you and you'll pay me for it. So there are some useful mechanics to proof of work. And I can't deny the things that you said about how it affects the governance. That is, there's the people who own the hardware and who make, you know, most of the decision or all the really all the decisions in proof of work currencies. 
and uh, then there are uh, you know the proof of stakeholders. And I feel like if we completely got rid of proof of work, we'd be throwing away something that we know works, and we know it works pretty well, but we know it doesn't work when it comes to governance. So you know, in terms of a sort of zeroth order way of decentralizing a ledger. It works great, but then once you start to get into the intricacies to be like, well, where are all the ASICs? Who's paying for the ASICs? Are governments subsidizing that power? You know, there's all kinds of nastiness that gets involved there. So we saw it as proof of work works, but just not out on you know in a governance context, which is why we left it. So let's 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 then walk through your um, your sort of governance system or. Yeah, like the, the governance system of Decred, right? So you have these, you have this system of tickets, by by which is like a mechanism by which like shareholders can influence their, um, can exert their influence on blocks and like future changes. So explain to us this system of tickets. So the the concept is is that you every every block is approved by it's kind of like a two factor authentication system. The proof of work miners create a block. And then the proof of stake miners have their tickets are called the vote, and then those votes either approve or uh, they either approve or disapprove of the previous block. So the way that the that these votes occur though is that the the proof of stake miners first lock up uh, some coins. There's an algorithm that determines how many coins that need to be locked up at any given time in order to maintain a, a target pool size of these tickets that are outstanding to be chosen to be chosen from. However, the so they the, at a high level, the stakeholders lock up uh, some coins uh, for an average of 28 days. However, it could be up to 142 days. There's a there's a range in there. It's a it's just like mining, and there's a Poisson distribution. There's a target. However, it you know it varies depending on probability. So they they lock up these coins for this period of time, and then their ticket is randomly selected from the pool. And when that ticket is selected, it's given the the power to vote. And the, the, this where five of those are selected per block. So that's kind of the the thousand yard view of how it works, as far as the the, the tickets are concerned. Well, I think I think another thing that's worth pointing out here is the is the high level uh, approach, which is that say when we talk about proof of work to connect to your prior question. Proof of work is basically a gamification of the timestamping system. So basically it creates a game out of timestamps. It goes, hey guys, let's create a timestamp so that none of us are the one timestamp creator and we can you know, basically keep this ball rolling. It turns into a game, people mine their computers. So based on your relative share of hash power, it's like a lottery where you, you get the machines, you spin them up, you go to the lottery and oh, you won the ticket 10% of the time because you have 10% of the hash. With Decred, what we've done is we've gamified the governance layer and the proof of stake layer uh, at the same time by going, there's a there's these uh, tickets, and then the idea is, is that you buy tickets, and buying tickets is supposed to be analogous to purchasing hardware for proof of work mining. The idea that you're going, I'm a, I have some skin in this game, I'm going to sort of put some money on the table, and like you know, let's let's hope they call my numbers. And by doing that, what you the gamification means that we spread out and distribute the process of uh, you know validating blocks and steering the currency because ultimately proof of stake sort of trumps proof of work in in Decred. So this ticketing system where and there's a ticket price that goes up and down internally per Dave's explanation that allows for the gamification to incur internal to Decred as opposed to you know having to have some other mechanism like follow the Satoshi or or you know a, a more standard proof of activity uh, algorithm. One thing that I'm not quite understanding is the relation to this and governing updates in the system. So as far as I understand it right now, I mean, you're, what you're describing is you're describing block validation. So the, the miners will, uh, will mine, a miner will mine a block and then that block will be voted on uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a proof of stake with a proof of stake algorithm. But that's, that's to validate blocks and, 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 um, and write them into the blockchain. How does that tie into blockchain governance, such as like we need to update the protocol to like say two megabyte blocks, and um, we're going to use this system to do that? Whenever those votes take place, there are actually some additional things we call them vote bits, but um, a signaling mechanism essentially is what it is that allow for whenever an upgrade is or something is up for vote, those bits get assigned certain meaning. So, for example, if you're voting on upgrading, which we've already done the, the 
ticket price algorithm, or in the case of if you wanted to vote on increasing the block size or, or anything really, that bit has a certain meaning. And so the stakeholders, whenever they cast their bit or their vote, excuse me, they'll set those bits according to whatever their preferences are. And then the consensus rules, that is the, every node on the network all agrees and, and every node does this, is they will end up tallying up all of those pref all those votes that got cast of the bits across a certain interval and you know it either passes or it doesn't. And so they're, it's, it's a pretty complex system and, and I think later on we'll go into it a little bit more. But the, the general idea is that these votes when they get cast in addition to approving the previous block also allow preferences to be set or you know that way they're actually voting on specific issues or agendas and then those are in turn enforced by consensus to consensus basically says okay well there was a yes vote we're going to activate the new rules there was a no vote we're not going to activate it and there's no, you know there's no way to change that that's the, those are why well, you can change it over time but that's the uh, it, it, there's no uh, user interactivity there right i mean the, the vote happens and it succeeds or it doesn't and then the rules themselves enforce that result so so for example uh, if uh, plus five you know like decred we ultimately have 21 million coins this is the same as bitcoin right and uh, maybe around four or five million of them already exist so so assume like I, i'm a relatively large holder i own let's say hundred thousand coins then uh, the way i can participate in this governance gamification this governance game is I lock up these hundred thousand coins, and these hundred thousand coins. When I lock these hundred thousand coins up, there's a variable amount of time from twenty eight days to one forty two days, and when that variable amount of time is up, I will be issued some tickets, right? And the system sort of balances in such a way that there are like forty thousand outstanding tickets at 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 at, at all times. And like when once I get one of these tickets, I can. Uh, it's like when a block is created, there are forty thousand tickets in total. Five of these tickets will be chosen to vote on uh, on accepting the previous block, as well as the agenda, the outstanding agendas, correct? As well as the outstanding agenda. So so basically, when I'm when I'm locking the coins, I'm getting a claim on the future tickets that will be issued and once i have these tickets that those allow me to sometimes randomly become part of the pool of five tickets that will uh, that will vote on the block issues correct so the one thing is when you instead of like you lock the coins up but when you're locking the coins you are locking them in exchange for a ticket so that that process as opposed to being delayed it happens right then and there you get a ticket um, technically, there's actually a day that it has to wait for maturity reasons. But after those maturities uh, is over, your ticket goes into that pool. And then from that pool, the five are randomly chosen each block. And that is why there's a variable amount of time. Because there are no... Every ticket in the pool has the exact same probability. It's all independent probability. And so, you know, you could buy a ticket and it goes into the pool and it could vote the very first block that it's eligible to vote or you know, it could expire all the way. There's a very small chance that it will expire without ever voting. And so the the reasoning for that is kind of, I think, where you were going with your, your question is that, you know, you you don't want to have a system where it's easy to game the results, right? You, you want to make sure that it's fair for everybody involved. And so by having to lock up those coins and by making it an independent probability for every ticket, you, you're not giving any unfair advantage to any individual person or any, any individual entity. It's a completely independent probability. So let's say today um, a million coins are being locked up in order to get these tickets, right? And suddenly for, for some reason, in the next five days, an extra million also get locked up, right? Like for some reason, like people go crazy, like everyone wants tickets now. And in these five days, a lot of new coins come in locked up. Does, and I had locked up my coins previously, so my 100,000 coins for the part of the early million. Will it be that when more people lock up their coins, I will get less tickets? The way the ticket price algorithm works is as follows. In order to maintain a stable uh, ticket pool size of roughly 40,000 tickets, 
uh, the price will go up in response to demand for more tickets. So in the scenario you described, let's say you have a million coins staked. The way it works is that there's effectively, you know, over time, if you average everyone's uh, ticket purchases and you go, what's the average price of a ticket in the ticket pool? That you're going to pay somewhere near that number before the, the second million coins show up. So the first million, you got them in there, you got them at price X. Then when the second million comes, the price of the tickets is going to surge in an effort to basically prevent the, the uh, ticket pool size from bloating. And the reason we do that is so that we can maintain sort of, you know, we can manage everyone's expectations. People have an understanding that there's going to be roughly 0.5% of the tickets expire without voting. Uh, you don't really lose any money, you lose a fee from that. But then um, the rest of the tickets will vote and they're, you know, with a rough average of 28 days until they vote from the time that they, they've matured and after you've bought them. The, um, it's funny that you mentioned this idea, you know, what would happen if a million of these coins show up. What w in the previous system, now we had the, the, we recently changed the ticket pricing algorithm. And with the old ticket pricing algorithm, it would have gone absolutely berserk and the price would have gone all over the place. But we, it, we actually modeled this in, as part of our design of the new uh, ticket uh, price algorithm. So that in the case that the price surges, the, you know, the pool size will surge for, for a little bit, but then it will come back down uh, over time as a function of basically the ticket price shoots up People stop buying tickets and wait for it to come back down. Then it comes back down and people slowly start buying tickets again. And then it comes back to a, you know, like a stable ticket price. And what that'll do is that won't affect tickets. It could affect tickets that you bought in the sense that the amount of time until those tickets vote is longer, but in the, it won't affect the price you paid for those tickets. So your rate of return is really mostly a function of what you paid for the ticket. If the pool size surges a bit, it'll, it'll affect your returns a bit, but it won't, it won't drastically change your, your returns. So then if you, if you're the person who showed up and bought the, you know, the second, you know, raft of, you know, million coins worth of tickets, you're going to get a higher ticket price and your return will be lower. And if, you know, there's more demand for tickets in general, the price of tickets goes up and then the yield from those tickets goes down over time. So with the system, once, once the proof of stake, um, users have, uh, voted on blocks that have previ that uh, that have previously been um, uh, mined by miners. What prevents miners from ignoring these votes and just continue mining blocks as they were mining them previously? So presumably not implementing changes that would have been voted on by the proof of stake validators. Right. So again, that comes down to the consensus rules that are encoded in all of the clients. Uh, one of the, uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but one of the requirements is, is that a block has to have three votes. The miner must include three votes. And since the miner can't choose those votes, it's, it's, it's chosen specifically by this lottery process, they don't have a choice. They have to include those votes or their block simply will be rejected by the network. So they have to include, there has to be at least three of those five votes. Um, that extends a bit, I think, where you were going when you start talking about forks and things like that. Like, why don't they just keep, you know, why don't they ignore the new rules? Yeah, why can't they going? just fork? <laughs> right. And so the, the, the reason for that is, is because uh, you think of it this way, that the majority of the votes follow the, the majority, well, whichever way they voted. So they're going to follow the majority chain in that case. And because they're not going to cast votes on the other chain, the other chain can't continue. It won't get the votes. So because every block requires those three votes to even extend the chain, now they can keep trying. Um, I don't want to go too much in depth there, but the the fact is there 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 is a way that you can remine the block to change the hash, which will in turn cause different tickets to be chosen. So you can keep trying, but it's so much more expensive to try and keep that old chain going that way because you, you're not getting the votes. People people aren't nobody's voting so you have to keep trying again and again you keep mining the same block over and over and the further back you get it's it's worse right it's the same principle is whenever you have a the reason you don't have very long reorgs in bitcoin is because the fact that the further the deeper it gets the the lower the probability it gets that something that the people are going to go back and mine that many and it's the same principle here you can't get the votes on the minority chain it gets increasingly more expensive and then the chain just dies I think there's another point to add here, which is that beyond the three vote minimum per uh, you know per block, there's a linear there's a linear scaling of the proof of work reward. So 
if your proof of if the proof of work block that you mined includes all five votes, you get a hundred percent of the proof of work subsidy. And then for every vote less than that that you include, it scales it down by twenty percent. So if you only include four votes, you're going to get eighty percent, or three votes, sixty percent, and then anything less than that is not a valid block. So uh, so there is so there is a real tangible penalty for trying to omit votes from uh, from blocks that you mine. And speaking of mined blocks, can this voting mechanism, for instance, roll back the blockchain? So could proof of stake miners decide that a set of transactions uh, shouldn't be included into the blockchain? I don't know, say, for instance, after some sort of wallet uh, being hacked or, uh, you know, some sort of contract uh, uh, executing a replay attack. Um, could, uh, could, could the proof of stake miners decide, okay, we don't want these transactions uh, to be included in the blockchain? So technically, yes, it would require a hard fork vote in the sense that, you know, somebody would have to, somebody being developers, would have to code up the, uh, the, the new rules that say that, okay, we're going to, you know, either ignore these transactions or undo them or whatever the case may be. And then that would create a hard fork and it would have to go through the majority vote. So theoretically, it is possible. However, I think uh, one of the big differences is that rather than there being some benevolent dictator that just says, oh, too bad, we're doing it, you need majority stakeholder approval. Everybody has to vote on that for it to happen. And uh, I personally believe that such a vote like that most likely won't pass because it's a pretty gross violation of trust, right? I mean, one of the biggest fundamental things is that you know, somebody else can't mess with your wallet, right? I mean, if you're going to try and steal coins from somebody else, what's going to stop anybody else from trying to steal coins from you? And, I, you know, I, I think that most stakeholders understand that that is a, you know, it's sort of a slippery slope. So I personally believe you would have a very difficult time getting a majority stake to vote on doing that. So your 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 ticketing system is... You're saying it's, it's actually, complex, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite involved, right? Like there's a coin and then these coins allow you to get tickets when you log these coins up. And then some tickets are randomly chosen to vote on each block. Uh, has there been any, any academic study of uh, the suitability of this system and on like how people could game this system using some kind of strategic behaviors? There has been some exploration of that topic with there's a there's a proof of activity paper, which was uh, I think it was released sometime in 2014. So it was released, uh, you know, six to, you know, six to 12 months after the original uh, MC2 coin paper. And the uh, what had ended up happening was they looked at this attack from the perspective of a proof of act, proof of activity where it was it had to follow the satoshi prescription but th it was the same idea that there's proof of stake and proof of work and they're hybridized and then they ask questions how much would it cost to execute a successful attack on a currency that has a hybridization system like this and basically the conclusion is is that yes there are attacks where you basically own a big chunk of stake and a big chunk of the mining and you collude but the cost of executing one of those attacks is substantially greater than just proof of work alone. And I think that D Dave is much more familiar with the details of the, uh, the cost of the attack than I am offhand. But I believe it, you know, it's a substantial multiplier over the 51% attack cost. So you know, in terms of its attack resistance, it has been looked at. And the analysis provided in, in uh, the paper by his, uh, Lee Mizrahi, Lee Mizrahi Rosenfeld, and I think there's a fourth author. Um, Mentoff. Mentoff, okay. Mentoff. And so their paper um, really covered this attack vector, and it does apply fully to Decred as far as I know. The only caveats being that, in, you know, in terms of how much stake you need to control, it's a question of how much of the staked funds you need to control relative to how much, and it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but it's very close. Maybe you can say more about it, Dave? This is a, a little bit outdated information, but it, it still holds true. Uh, you know, in the in the proof of work system, you only really have to purchase fifty one percent of the hash power, and if you calculate all that out, it actually is roughly around five hundred million dollars right now to carry out that attack. Um, if you assume the exact same price of uh, that Bitcoin has, the same number of coins that are outstanding, the same hash power that it has, in order to do an apples to apples comparison, underneath the decred system, that same attack 
would be roughly $2.8 billion. And the reason is because you have to purchase a lot of the stake too. So you have to own a, a lot of the currency in addition to, to hash power. There's a, actually a, a formula that is in that proof of activity paper that allows you to specifically calculate what percentage of each you need in order to successfully carry out any kind of attack against it. And so, you know, we, we've used that in order to, to calculate the, these figures. Um, there is one other piece of that that is relevant that the formula doesn't take into account, and that is in order to acquire that much stake to begin with, uh, you're going to cause the price to go up even more because a lot of remember that we you know you a lot of these coins are staked so they're not on the market so they're not for sale so if somebody wants to come in and try and get 30 percent 50 percent of the stake or whatever uh, the coins aren't even available first of all because they're locked up but even if they could in order to purchase that many coins on the market you're going to cause the price to skyrocket because you're trying to buy up every single outstanding coin so it makes the attack even more expensive than than just that formula shows so that you know in short it is it is really a more robust system and is a whole lot more expensive to attack than a pure proof of work system this episode is brought to you by shapeshift the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies including bitcoin ether zcash gnosis monero golem augur and so many more when you go to shapeshift.io you simply select your currency pair give them your receiving address send the coins and boom shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange you don't need to create an account you don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins so you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So let's move on to this idea of hard fork voting. Um, can you describe uh, how the hard fork voting works, and then afterwards, let's talk about a, a, a real live example of um, a hard a hard fork vote that was uh, carried out on uh, Decred. Sure. So it's a pretty involved process, but I'll try to keep it pretty high level, uh, so we can get through it quickly. the The basic process is that first, the developers code up whatever the change is uh, and there also it has to be a company with technical documentation that describes you know what the change is what the pros and cons are so that stakeholders are informed enough to be or you know educated enough to be able to make an informed decision so the, the first stage is that that you code it up and you actually put it into the software and it's put in an inactive state uh, there are versions we have several versions involved here that have to basically happen and sort of in lockstep um, so one of them is the block version. This is very similar to Bitcoin, and that is the proof that the proof-of-work miners have upgraded. They bump the block version to say they've upgraded. Now, a, a big difference in our system versus the systems in, in other proof-of-work coins is that upgrading itself does not mean that the new feature is going to take place. In, in most of the other systems, when you upgrade the block version, they're signaling, hey, I want the changes that come along with this block version. In Decred, that's not the case. The only reason the version exists is to signal that I have upgraded, therefore I am capable of understanding the new rules. I don't necessarily agree with them. It doesn't mean I want them, but I can understand them. And, and should the, the rules become active, I know how to properly validate them. That's sort of that version. The other version that we have is on the stakeholder side, because in addition to the, the proof of work miners that are creating the blocks, you also have the, the wallets, the people, the stakeholders that are casting the votes. So they also obviously, um, not obviously, but as we discussed before, there are those vote bits that set the preferences. So those change over time depending on what the agendas that are being voted on are. And that means that the version in the proof of stake side needs to be able to understand what those bits mean too. It's like, I know what I'm voting on. You know, I understand the agenda. This is what I'm voting on. So once those two things happen, there are some thresholds that, that have to be reached in order for those two things to, to proceed. But once those are done, then that's when the actual vote itself starts. 
Um, the vote takes uh, roughly, it's about a month, and the, the primary purpose of that is that we want to make sure that there is a at least one full turnover of that target ticket pull size that we discussed before. We want to make sure that there's at least one full turnover so that there's a very good uh, you know, uh, selection that we're actually taking everybody's voice into account that we possibly can reasonably. So after that month passes, you either... You, you pass the vote with a majority yes, or you fail the vote with a majority no, or you had somewhere in between. If there's a majority yes, there's a lock-in period. Those rules, and, that, and the, the purpose of this is that those rules will activate at that point. They were voted in, they are going to activate, but they're not activated yet. And the reason this is important is because, you know, you have businesses out there that well, will, might have to make changes to their software because of these changes, whatever they are. And so you need to make sure to give the businesses time this is like, hey guys, you know, this will happen. You need to upgrade your software, not just businesses, but all the users too. Everybody who's running the software needs to upgrade. So it's to give them a, a, a sufficient period to do the necessary upgrades. And in the case, and then after that lock-in period is done, it just activates. That's all. Like I said, it's already in the 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 consensus rules. The new rules activate, and it's at that point that the actual hard fork takes place. So if you have not upgraded your software by that point, you get forked off the network. You know, you have to upgrade. So in, in the very beginning, when you signal your intention to want to vote on a new piece of software, you said that you had to upgrade your software so that you can understand those bits. Does that imply that the software is always sort of in two states, like one where it understands the current consensus model mechanism, but also can understand the potential future consensus mechanism should it be voted upon like is there is there like a like an in-between state where the software understands two consensus mechanisms you can think about it like this right which is that you come in with one set of consensus rules and what you're voting on is you're voting on changes to those consensus rules so you have consensus rule set one and then you're voting on whether you should change it to rule set two, which has some modifications, or leave it the same. In the future, we might have multiple you know, knobs that people can turn it to, but the upshot really is, is that hard fork voting is just for voting on consensus changes. And you know, these, are, uh, these are some of the most contentious and difficult to execute changes. I mean, typically, you know, if we're talking about Ethereum or Monero, or, you know, uh, or any of these other sort of, you know, uh, less governance focused, uh, you know, coins out there, which is that and when they execute a hard fork or you know, when they execute a hard fork, there's someone there literally like throwing the switch. There might be a soft signaling mechanism to say, oh, we want to hard fork per Dave C's uh, comments earlier, uh, you know, earlier in the talk. But um, the hard, uh, you know, switch throwing act is something that, you know, hard, the hard fork voting is basically we wire up a switch in the track and then everyone votes on which, on which switch of the track we take. And in doing that, you know, there's, there's some soft signaling that needs to happen. And like you said, you know, there's this issue of are you interpreting two consensus rule sets or one? And really you're only interpreting one. And then as of a certain marker, which is at the end of the activation waiting period that, that Dave described, only then does the consensus rule set to activate if it, if it had enough votes. Okay. So can you walk us through an example? So recently there was, uh, you, you put this into practice by upgrading the difficulty algorithm. So there was an upgrade to the consensus rules. Talk about how that went through. Um, you know, was it successful? How, how that sort of happened and played out? The old algorithm that we had, um, we, we mentioned earlier in the talk that you want to try to maintain that sort of target pull size so that everybody's expectations are managed. You, you know approximately how long it's going to take before your vote happens and approximately what your expiration percentage is going to be. So those are all tied to that pull size. Uh, the old algorithm did a pretty good job of maintaining that pull size. It's a little over target, but overall it did pretty good. But the price swung wildly. It would go from a price that was really low, so everybody would want to buy tickets, and there was this huge uh, mad rush where everybody was like, I want these cheap tickets, my yield is really high, and there was, there was a whole bunch of competition, and that caused the fees to, to get really high. And then the price would jump up uh, a significant portion outside of the range that people were willing to pay for, a, for three more periods, and then it would return to that low period. And so it created this resonant cycle where it, uh, all the ticket purchases were happening in the low wind intervals 
and it was uh, not a very good user experience. And then there were some other you know, negative consequences of that, of that as far as the hash power is concerned. Um, basically, the proof of work miners realized that, hey, I get more fees if I point my hash power at Decred during this, this low interval when people are paying higher fees on the tickets. And so it would cause this sort of perverse incentive to direct your hash power at the network during a very short interval and then take it away. And of course, that would cause some, some not really havoc per se, but it would change the uh, expectation of how quickly blocks are are being produced. So it would it would speed up during the period and then elongate during the other periods. And so, you know, we, we realized and we saw that this was going to be an issue. Uh, it was becoming one more and more as more people wanted the stake and the stake participation was rising. And so we created the new algorithm. We did an entire simulation uh, framework for it. We simulated it. It was all open on GitHub. We, we got uh, feedback from several different community members. We tried, I want to say, in total... I ran something like 350 uh, simulations. Um, but in the end, we landed on an algorithm. We implemented it in the code. And then we started the, you know, we let all the stakeholders know what was going on. And we started the vote. The vote progressed. And so I think an interesting point here is that it was actually a controversial change because of the fact that, um, as I mentioned, the fees were really high during those periods. So Part of changing this algorithm so that the ticket purchases are spread out more evenly across the blocks means that the proof-of-work miners earn less fees. So they didn't want the change. Right? But even though it's better for the decred as a whole, it solved a lot of the other things that I talked about, some of those issues, and of course proof-of-stake miners wanted it. The proof-of-work miners really didn't want it because it's going to reduce the amount of money that they can make. And so the, the, the interesting thing, though, is that after the vote, ended up going through, it ended up being like a 98%, uh, I don't remember the exact percentage, maybe 98.6, but a high 98 uh, percentage of voters who voted yes for the algorithm. And the primary reason for that is that a lot of times when you have what seems to be or what appears to be a lot of contention, because there's a lot of people on social media, there, you know, there's one or two guys out there being really loud saying, oh, we, you know, this is terrible. The end of the world is going to happen, whatever. They're, you know, the, the, the contentiousness usually comes from a very small minority of people. And the reality is, is that when you actually have these on-chain voting mechanism and you can actually poll people in a trustlessly uh, in democratic fashion, you'll find that a lot of times there isn't as much contention as there seems to be. And that was actually the result here. It looked like there was a ton of contention, but when the vote actually came down, it was you know 98% positive. And so the vote happened, the new algorithm, you know, it, it happened exactly as planned. The, there was a lock-in period. The new algorithm took effect, and um, you know, I, we could show the chart at some point if you want to, but it went from having a sort of sinusoid pattern in the ticket price to being almost a straight line now. And the number of ticket purchases are, are spread evenly across the blocks, which is a, a much preferred situation. It improves the user experience for the users, and uh, it got rid of the you know, perverse incentives for the, the hash power that I was speaking of earlier. And something else that I think is relevant here is is that the, all of this happened pretty recently. the The first hard fork vote uh, on you know on the uh, ticket price algorithm. Um, I think we pushed the code out sometime in April. Um, these uh, you know the the proof of work miners and the proof of stake miners upgraded per the process Dave described. And then the voting began, and uh, I think the voting began in early May. It ended in early June, and then the new rules activated. I think it was either July eighth or July 9th. So um, you know, so all of this, you know, at least it, it working in production is a very new thing. And one of the reasons that you and everyone else might not have heard about it is because we we didn't want to publicize it too much, and then you know, not have it work when we when we had it running on mainnet. So. So that's uh, so, so that's the sort of recent history of, of of this vote. Is this like one of the first hot swaps? Like, uh, so for example, like when there's this, this ICO, one of these selling points was okay. There's going to be a protocol, and like while the chain is running, you could change the rules. Um, like like while the chain chain is running, but it seems that you have already done it. Yeah, it's it's their their goal is a, is basically the same thing that you know they want to have a, a way to vote on consensus changes that just happen whenever uh, the vote succeeds and and that is correct uh, that that is exactly what Decred does and it has already happened. Is there any other project that 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 has a capability like this? 
There are none that I know of. There are projects that have voting type systems. However, they're all, what I was speaking of earlier, uh, is that they're all pretty much at a layer where it's sort of soft signaling. And I think Jake mentioned it too. It's like, hey, we want this, but ultimately it's up to, you know, one guy <laughs> to flip the switch, right? It's not actually on chain. Um, you know, with this system, the 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 rule change is put in place and then you know we could all go get hit by a bus it doesn't matter it's going to happen if the stakeholders voted in right there's nobody that has to flip the switch it's built into the protocol it's transparent it's provable it's cryptographically secured uh, totally trustless um, and, and I don't know of any other system that actually and I know Tezos wants to or Tezos however you say it I know that that's their ultimate goal but it, you know that they, they don't have it yet um, and that's the only other project that I know of the hard part for us too, you know, when we when we're answering questions about Tezos is is that until we, you know, until there's a production code base that we can look at and go, ah, oh, this is how they're doing it. It's it, it is legitimately difficult to do a compare and contrast. Like say in the case of Dash, you know, I think Dash is a production system. They beat us to the governance thing. I'll I'll give them that. But their system is, per Dave's comments, it's a soft signaling system. At least it is right now, where changes will be proposed and people can have a snap vote that occurs very quickly. So they can get, you know, they can, they can assess their, their, uh, you know, what uh, master node sentiment very quickly. But even if the master nodes all vote, yes, someone, you know, someone within the project has to go wire up the consensus changes, just, you know, just like we were discussing. And then, you know, they have to throw a centralized switch as opposed to the way we've done it, where we pre-wire all the changes and go, we can go whichever way you guys want. We hope we didn't wire this up in vain, but if you guys don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. And uh, one of the key points there that I that I find really attractive is that a lot of times people only look at it from the standpoint of, um, you know, oh, did this get activated or not? However, so a key point is that it's actually quite important that if something doesn't get activated, that if you get a majority no vote, that is actually a very desirable outcome too. Sure, you may not be happy that you put the work in and your you know whatever didn't get activated, but that tells you move on, right? Find another solution. You're not going to spend the next two years arguing about it. It's done. It was a majority no. You know, find another way, right? Let, let's move on and just keep things rolling. Cool. Like, yeah, this system sounds sounds really interesting. Like, yeah, the idea of like pre-wiring all, all the clients to, uh, to understand both the old chain and the new chain and then there they being a vote and an automatic like hot swap from the old consensus rules to the new consensus rules while the chain is running. Uh, yeah, this to me somehow it feels like, yeah, this is the, this is at least one of the directions all cryptocurrency systems will end up going going to one way or another but yeah congratulations on yeah, being probably one of the first to to implement it so that that kind of brings us to the final topic which is that uh with, with decred as far as i understand part of the block reward actually goes to the developers which in this case is is you and your company and uh, we like to understand how much goes to the developers and like how are, how are these funds, where do these funds go to and how are they utilized and uh, what, how do you seek to evolve that system? So the way the, the development subsidy works right now is 10% of every block subsidy gets sent to a multi-sig address. That multi-sig address con corresponds to what is currently a centralized entity that manages development called Decred Holdings Group LLC. It's a Nevis LLC, and I'm uh, I'm a manager of the uh, LLC. So, the way we've been doing this is is that in terms of how th the development organization fits into the development of the project overall, is that people show up and some of these people are very interested in Decred. There's a lot of people who are just, you know, who show up in our Slack, they want to talk, they want to hang out. Some of these people are even more interested and they and they go, you know what, I really want to take a close look at your source code or, you know, I want to help you build the, build this software. I want to help you market or I'm really good at documentation. And I noticed there were some gaps in your documentation. So people show up and are interested and, you know, what we've, what we've been doing is, is that Company Zero is really sort of the the main um, contractor at this point, and they and and that's the company that I run. And uh, what we do is is that we do all the development work, uh, you know, in house, and then we bill the project for that for that work at no markup. 
And the purpose of doing this is, is that you, know, you, you need money to build out one of these systems. Uh, Bitcoin is a great example of a tragedy of the commons in the sense that, you know, say before Blockstream, there are some, you know, the Bitcoin core developers, are, there are some very talented people there, but no one was really getting paid. So uh, it creates a tragedy of the commons situation. And we've sort of fixed that by having this developer subsidy. But this is just a short-term arrangement. The idea being that over the next uh, six to 12 months, what we'll be doing is we'll actually be dissolving the development organization and placing these funds that are currently in a multi-sig wallet into what, it, what might be a, you know, a pay to script hash or, uh, you know, or another uh, form of storage. And then those funds will be controlled by the stakeholders via a proposal system where, I mean, let me give you an example. You might be uh, you know, someone who's a marketing contractor. You show up and you have a really great idea for a marketing campaign. You talk to some of the marketing people, they go, oh, that's a pretty good idea. You make a proposal and then people vote on it. If enough, peop if enough of the stakeholders say yes, it will, it'll get funded and, fun and, and your work will be paid for from what is essentially the Decred DAO. Um, it doesn't exist yet, but we're sort of building backwards to get to that point. So the way everything is funded right now is we have a stopgap, which is a centralized entity that pays contractors. Basically, if you're interested and you show up and you do some work and the work is, and the work is good, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you about uh, you know, paying you to continue doing this work. And um, that's sort of how things are running now. And you know, we hope to basically continue a similar model, but one where stakeholder uh, approval is explicit and on-chain. So tell us about the the current use case for for Decred. I mean, it's it, it's a currency. You know, there's a there's a there's a market cap. There's a price. Um, is it being used as a currency? Are merchants accepting it? Are there use cases that are being built around it? There are a handful of merchants who who uh, you know are services that accept Decred as a means of payment. Uh, Wirex is one of them. Um, another one is Coin Payments. Coin Payments had, uh, I think, had the payment, you know, had Decred offline for a little bit. Um, the upshot, I mean, the way I see it is, is that any of these projects, whether it's Bitcoin or any of, you know, or any of the follow-on cryptocurrencies that we've seen over the past several years, it's it almost always starts out as a store of value first. And then, you know, after that store of value sort of gains some, uh, you know, legitimacy, people want to then start spending it as opposed to just trading it in a speculative context. So, you know, I feel like we're still in the, in the phase where it's more a store of value than it is a, uh, you know, a, what is it, a means of transmitting that value. And I think that the reason that people consider it an attractive store of value is because of the returns you can earn from being a stake, uh, you know, a staker, in addition to the fact that you get to participate in the governance at the same time. So it's, uh, you know, it's, we're more in the store of value uh, phase right now, but, uh, you know, as the project matures, we're really going to be focusing a lot more on merchant acceptance and payment processing. Okay, great. Well, uh, Jake and Dave, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was fascinating to uh, learn all about Decred and the interesting work that you're doing around governance. And we'll be uh, interested in hearing uh, developments uh, about Decred in the future and uh, you know, as, as you roll out more features and uh, as, uh, as the... The community and the and the and the currency is, uh, itself um, can you continue to grow. Thank you. All right. Thank you for having us. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. Uh, Epicenter is part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. You can find this show and lots of other great shows at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, if you like the show, there's multiple ways you can support us. Uh, you can leave us a tip. Uh, and the tipping address will be in the show description. And if you don't want to leave, leave us a tip, you can just uh, leave us an iTunes review. Go to iTunes, leave us a review. It helps people find the show and for the show to get referenced there. Uh, so thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.